Good afternoon. I'm Jacqueline Jones, and it is my honor to serve as president and CEO of the Foundation for Child Development. Last June, with contributions from a remarkable set of authors, the Foundation launched our most recent publication, Getting It Right, Using Implementation Research to Improve Outcomes in Early Care and Education. The link to that publication may be found in the chat box. This work is all about getting a more complete picture of how programs for young children are operating. We hope this work will provide insights into the value of including implementation research in the study of early childhood interventions, and that it will highlight the potential of such research to improve programs and policies leading to stronger child outcomes. On July 14th, we presented part one of a three-part summer webinar series that takes a deeper look into the publication. Today, we welcome you to part two of the series as we examine the use of implementation research in early care and education. I am honored to introduce our presenters, many of whom are also contributing authors to the work. First, you will hear from Dr. Sarah Vecchiati, who serves as the Foundation's Vice President of Research and Program Innovation. She will provide opening remarks and set the stage for this discussion. She's also author of the publication's final chapter. Dr. Tamara Halley, a senior scholar in the early childhood research area at Child Trends, will explain the ways in which implementation research and improvement science can work together to achieve stronger child outcomes. Dr. Joanne Shui, the director of the Family Wellbeing and Children's Development Policy Area at MDRC, will share insights about how the principles and designs of implementation research studies can help us to better understand how to bring programs and practices to scale. And then Dr. Milagros Norez, who is co-director of research and associate research professor at the National Institute for Early Education Research at Rutgers, will explain how equity-focused implementation research can be an effective tool in identifying if programs are working towards reducing inequities and ensuring that the evaluations themselves do not introduce bias. Dr. Sharon Ryan, Professor of Early Childhood Education, also at Rutgers, will describe how qualitative studies can contribute to our understanding of variation across sites and localities. And we are delighted to welcome Dr. Caroline Ebanks, who serves as the team lead for early childhood research in the Teaching and Learning Division of the Institute for Education Sciences. Dr. Ebanks, who oversees the Federal Early Learning Network, will serve as our discussant and will share her reflections on the collective body of work presented today. Finally, we must thank two additional individuals. Sharice Bramer, communications officer at the foundation, who has helped to plan and execute this Getting It Right summer series and is providing technical support today. And Dr. Christine Andrews, program area director and senior research scientist at Child Trends. We thank her for her collaboration on planning this webinar. She will also lead today's Q&A. A few logistics. At the end of the webinar, we will have a question and answer session. Please submit your questions for presenters through the chat box or the question box. Either is fine, chat or question. You may submit a question at any time throughout the webinar. However, those questions will not be addressed until the end of the session during the official Q&A session. So please follow the foundation on Twitter at FCDUSORG and use the hashtag getting it right to share your thoughts. Now I'm very pleased to turn the discussion over to Dr. Vecchiati. Sarah. Thank you, Jacqueline. For over a hundred years, the foundation has supported research on the well-being of young children. Our work is centered on filling gaps in research knowledge and making research more relevant and useful to policymakers and practitioners. Our new publication began as a set of questions about what is really working in interventions for young children. We know that well-executed randomized controlled trials can give us evidence of the impact of early care and education on the performance of young children. Yet RCTs alone do not always lead us to a clear understanding of exactly why some children's performance may go up or down. This new work proposes that we augment RCT findings with rigorous empirical data that can provide important information about the context in which the intervention is being conducted. We especially hope to engage applied researchers who wish to use their methodological skills 
to help policymakers and practitioners figure out the right questions that need to be answered if we are to enhance the quality of life for all young children. We also suggest that applied research is complex and often collaborative. Given the nature of such research, in the conclusion chapter, I suggest refreshing the perspective of applied researchers interested in taking on this work. First, I advise that researchers will likely need to embrace the messy in struggles and changes that arise while conducting such research. The messiness reflects the intricacies of the interventions and is precisely what makes the work so interesting. It helps if researchers have a deep appreciation for ever-evolving contexts, typically encompassing multiple layers of policy and programmatic decisions and surrounding conditions. It is not easy to develop or to unearth linkages between policy, between theory and practice, and it's definitely not easy to do this in real time on the ground interventions. Next, researchers will likely need to have extensive knowledge about various rigorous designs and methods of analysis to answer nuanced and interrelated questions nested within and across these implementation contexts. Researchers will also need to consider developing more collaborative relationships with policymakers and practitioners, especially when questions aim to continuously build, scale, and improve ECE programs and practices and policies. Building a collaborative process that encompasses the entire research process rather than just certain stages is an important shift in approach for applied researchers. Collaboration with research partners does not end with co-construction of research questions, but continues throughout the research design, data access and collection, and reporting. Jointly interpreting the data and determining the implications of findings also helps guide collaborative thinking about how to account for particular implementation contexts and can provide more insights into research to practice connections. Finally, researchers who engage in this work need to consider building their own knowledge base about their research partner's work, especially because they are examining the tensions between the planned ideal and actual implementation. To make meaningful and useful policy recommendations, researchers need to acquire operational knowledge, such as understanding a program or policy's specific purpose, elements, process, and history. Providing a common ground of shared operational knowledge can help to build and maintain trust among collaborators throughout all the stages of research. It can also help to manage appropriate expectations regarding what research can do to influence or support continuous quality improvement efforts. Armed with such knowledge, skills, and dispositions, applied implementation researchers can increase the potential of research to shape, improve, or transform ECE policy and programs in ways that allow programs to better serve their to serve children and their families. As the Getting It Right publication demonstrates, conducting sound, rigorous, high quality, early care and education research, implementation research to build evidence for the field is not for the faint of heart. In this publication, we have also attempted to lift up a variety of research questions that we think are important if we are to move forward and bring more early care and education programs to scale at the federal, state, and local levels. When public funds are allocated for interventions for young children, we have a dual set of obligations. First, to make sure that every child has access to the supports they need to grow, develop, and learn. And secondly, that public funds are invested wisely. We hope this publication can spark a conversation that will enhance both equity and accountability in ECE implementation research. We also hope to initiate a conversation that is centered on what else needs to be explored about how programs are operationalized and what shape new research should take. And we believe that multiple perspectives will serve to enrich this discussion. Today, as part of that continuing conversation, our panelists will explore answers to the following questions. How can various implementation research designs address questions relevant to the ECE field? How can improvement science be different from implementation science? What can we learn from implementation research principles to lead ECE programs, practices, and policies to better outcomes for young children? How are qualitative studies helping us understand variation across sites and localities implementing evidence-based programs? 
And finally, how can equity-focused implementation research be an effective tool for reducing bias in evaluations? The foundation is beyond grateful to all of our authors who have given their considerable time and expertise to this project. Many of them have conducted groundbreaking research that now serves as the foundation of our knowledge of what it takes to offer high quality early care and education. And as global attention has focused on issues of racial, economic, and social justice, we see from this foundational research that issues of equity have been part of the ECE landscape for a very long time. This work is an opportunity to build on our research foundations, to explore root causes, to examine our research methodology and build stronger connections across research policy and practice. So today, let's build this connection and to continue the conversation. So Tamara, please start off our conversation. Thank you so much, Sarah, and good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to be with you this afternoon and share with you a few key findings from uh, chapter 10 of the virtual volume entitled, How Implementation Science and Improvement Science Can Work Together to Improve Early Care and Education. And in this chapter, I introduce um, definitions and goals of both implementation science and improvement science and compare and contrast them a little bit to um, share how both frameworks can inform the work that we do in early care and education. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna share with you just a couple of key takeaway um, messages and themes from the chapter. And the first one is that implementation science and improvement science frameworks, while distinct, are relatively similar and can inform one another. And I think um, one way to show, I'm gonna share a couple of um, distinctions, um, but you'll also see how tremendously compatible and parallel some of these um, concepts are across these two frameworks. So starting with definitions, a common definition of implementation science is the systematic inquiry into the processes by which an evidence-based or evidence-informed intervention is enacted in the real world. And a common uh, definition of improvement science is a systematic examination of the methods and contextual factors that best facilitate quality improvement at the individual program and or system level. So right here, you probably see some similarities. Both of them are a systematic inquiry. Um, that's the science part of it, that it's systematic. Um, and they're inquiring about certain practices or certain pieces that make um, interventions and early childhood policies effective. And with implementation science, the focus is on evidence-based interventions or evidence-informed interventions. Whereas in improvement science, the focus is on facilitating quality improvement among practitioners. So that's a subtle difference, uh, but it's a significant one that um, you'll see plays out um, over time. Next slide. In the, um, in the chapter, I compare and contrast the different um, research questions, the different goals, um, areas of focus for these two frameworks. And, by and large, they share a lot of commonalities. And what I'm sharing here on this slide are just a few places where the emphasis is a little bit different across the two frameworks. And I wanted to point them out because the, there are subtle differences, but they are distinct. So for instance, with implementation science, the emphasis is on intervention fidelity. That is the faithful, um, representation of all of the different components of an evidence-based or evidence-informed intervention or practice or policy. Um, and with improvement science, uh, intervention fidelity is not the emphasis. The emphasis is more on um, how one um, improves upon or adapts those evidence-based practices to the current context and the individuals who are being asked to implement it. And so the emphasis in improvement science is more on what they call practice-based evidence instead of evidence-based practice, so that you are really looking to the practitioner to tell you, give you information about what's working um, and what could be, what could be uh, adjusted or adapted to work even better and improve things in that particular uh, context. That's just one example. Another uh, distinction between these two frameworks is in the amount of time 
that um, they posit it would take to get to um, evidence of improved outcomes or intended outcomes. So for Im implementation science, um, there's, there's a feeling that um, you would not want to look at or measure outcomes and intended outcomes of an evidence-based intervention or program until that program was fully implemented within a particular real-world context. And there is, um, through literature review and research, there's evidence that it takes between two to four years to get to full implementation of an evidence-based practice or program. And so imp implementation scientists would say you wouldn't really expect to see d changes on those um, far long-term outcomes um, until about two or four years down the road. Now, improvement science uh, claims that it, you can detect improvements in practice and even in, um, in outcomes that you're interested in much more quickly uh, within 12 to 18 months of starting your improvement practice methodologies. So that's just one example. Let's go to the next slide for purposes of keeping on time here. Okay, um, the second takeaway message is um, including implementation and improvement science into traditional program and policy evaluations can help explain results and plan for sustained outcomes. And here I'm reproducing a figure that's in chapter 10 of the volume that um, depicts a, um, a typical conceptual model for a program or policy intervention. And in the dark blue boxes, you see the typical um, features of a conceptual model or a logic model for a, um, a program intervention or a policy intervention where you have some resources that are brought to bear on the program or policy activities that are then implemented. And um, you have some indication that they had been implemented by looking at the outputs. And then you're looking um, to see whether those program activities uh, lead to short-term and long-term outcomes for either the practitioners, the recipients of that practice or policy or the organizations or systems in which they're embedded. And of course, you're um, interested in contextual factors and how those impact that relationship over time. What you see in the light gray boxes on this slide are all of those additional uh, features and elements of Im that implementation science posits are important to um, capture, look at, consider to understand the relationships between the program and policy activities as they're implemented and the outcomes that you get from those that implementation. And some of those include looking at stakeholder engagement and leadership, um, the readiness of individuals and organizations to engage with the program or policy, um, whether uh, there's a sufficient implementation infrastructure available that that um, individuals and organizations can draw upon to support those program activities, um, the use of data and feedback loops, and then looking at those implementation outcomes around feasibility, adaptability, um, acceptability, and uh, sustainability. Uh, so these are additional pieces of the puzzle that help explain the results we get, and also by focusing on those factors like leadership and implementation infrastructure and whether that's uh, existing and functioning well are things that are going to inform sustainability of the outcomes that you wish to, to attain by your program or policy. Next slide. A third uh, takeaway from this chapter is that research methods relevant to the study of effective implementation and quality improvement are compatible with methods used for early childhood program evaluation. And so what um, Sarah was just uh, describing about embedding some of these um, implementation methodologies and improvement methodologies into our traditional program evaluations can really benefit and help us understand the outcomes and uh, plan for sustainability. On this slide, I'm sharing just a couple of different um, of these kind of uh, innovative research and evaluation designs that have been used. Um, one of them is the effectiveness implementation hybrid design, which embeds implementation elements within a traditional uh, program um, efficacy or impact evaluation, and developmental evaluation, which embeds evaluation elements into um, a program that's focused mainly on implementation of a, of a program. 
Um, what all of these different methodologies have in common is the use of data and feedback loops on an iterative basis that and the information informing not only those who are evaluating whether the program or policy is working well, but also the practitioners and the program developers and how to better tweak and refine uh, what they're doing to improve outcomes. Next slide. Uh, this chapter ends with a couple of uh, recommendations, and one of which is to uh, develop more valid and reliable measures that capture important elements of implementation and improvement. So these would be measures that get at those gray boxes in that figure that I shared earlier. And uh, we have some measures of those implementation and improvement elements, uh, but not many of them have been developed specifically for use in the early care and education field. And so I would um, basically encourage us to either create new ones or adapt um, existing ones to apply towards our work in early care and education. Um, second recommendation is to uh, utilize new reporting guidelines that have been developed to report in um, journal publications, primarily the details of implementation that can help us uh, understand those linkages between what you're implementing in terms of the program components and the outcomes that you're getting. And I'm delighted that we have these reporting guidelines and look forward to seeing them used um, more frequently in our reports, both the gray literature and the published literature. And finally, um, there are new uh, improvement science methodologies, such as the Breakthrough Series Collaborative and um, Collaborative Improvement and Innovation Networks that are being used in the early care and education field. It's, it's relatively new that these um, methodologies are being implemented in early care and education settings. And I think what we need to do next for the field is to do more rigorous and systematic evaluation of these new methodologies, these improvement science methodologies to assess the spread and sustainability of quality improvements by these methods and also assess the cost effectiveness of these methods as they relate to more traditional or common methods of quality improvement in early care and education such as those um, done through coaching either individual or group coaching and quality improvement systems. So um, with that I'll pass it on to the next presenter. Thank you Tamara. Next up is Joanne who will be talking about scaling up early care and education programs with implementation research. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Tamara. So um, this is chapter nine that I'll be presenting on. And really what this chapter does is it aims to um, further kind of dig into the research, uh, implementation research frameworks and try and think about how to align measurement and methodological uh, approaches to systematically guide um, the implementation, the focus of implementation research. So next slide. So one of the key points that we're trying to underscore with this chapter is that, um, you know, that just as Tamara, just as uh, Sarah, just as Jacqueline had noted, that there are benefits of integrating implementation research in the study of our early care and education programs. So first, just as Tamara mentioned, there's the systematic inquiry into the act of carrying out a program or a how a program is received or how it's experienced uh, by participants in the real world setting. And so that's kind of the overarching definition of implementation research that um, is highlighted in this chapter. And from that, some of the benefits that come from it are that we can specify why, for whom, under what circumstances a program may or may not be effective when it's delivered in the real world. That information can be used to inform continuous improvement as a program evolves. So we all know that there is a program as it was initially designed, um, and then it is delivered in the real world. But then there may be adaptations that take place over time and also as uh, circumstances change, but also as a program increases in scope and scale and aims to reach a broader number of participants, there can be lessons learned there that then feed back and inform continuous improvement. 
And so the goal of implementation research, but that one of the things that also can be a benefit of implementation research is that it can really broaden our understanding of the influences that shape um, children's lives and the development of children with uh, diverse backgrounds. Um, and so really what we're trying to say here is that implementation research can influence and inform the um, efforts to scale, um, to sustain, um, and further strengthen um, existing ECE programming so that it can produce reliable impacts uh, for children with diverse backgrounds. So could you go to the next slide, please? So one of the things that we try and do in this chapter is really try and put a framework around saying, uh, um, highlighting key sources of variation that we may want to focus on when we're conducting systematic implementation research. So here we highlight two different, there's a number of bullet points on this slide, but really they fall into two different buckets. One is to look inward at how the program is implemented, so how it's designed, implemented and how it's enacted, but then also look outside of that to say, what are the contextual, institutional, other characteristics of the providers, and also the ECE system that might be surrounding that, that influences how that program or initiative is implemented or delivered, but then also what it is being compared to. So here in the bullet points, what we're highlighting is fidelity of implementation of the program and the implementation plan. So here really what we're talking about is there's a program that was designed a certain way. There's services that are offered or supports that are offered to children and or the ECE workforce um, that, that may align with the theory of change and that there are key components of that. But how those are delivered and whether or not the actual delivery of it aligns with the intended model is something that we really want to be interested and focused in. Um, then separately, we want to understand the characteristics of the individuals who are receiving the supports and services or the ECE programming. So who is it reaching? Is it consistently reaching uh, the intended population as designed? Um, we want to also think about the characteristics of the, of the program providers or who is delivering the services and whether or not that needs to be a source of systematic variation in kind of what is being delivered. Um, we also want to look outside of that at the institutional and contextual factors that surround the program that may be providing support uh, to the organization that's implementing the services. Um, or delivering ECE programming. But really, we also want to understand this last bullet point, which is any program that we design and deliver is it to be effective above and beyond business usual, it is compared to something else. And so what we want to understand systematically in implementation research is whether or not our delivery of the program model that we're really focused on is it above and beyond a, a difference in terms of the services that are provided um, to what might else be available in the community in a uh, locality? So, I, so the idea here is to look both inward at the, how the program is being implemented, but also look systematically externally around that. Um, and so this is one of the things that I, that we uh, aim to articulate in the chapter. Next slide. So after having delineated those different buckets of areas of inquiry that implementation research can focus on, the other thing is to think about, okay, so that is a nice list, but how then are we gonna translate that into measurement approaches that help us systematically understand those sources of variation. And with this slide, what we're trying to highlight is a, a couple of things. One is that we know, as I alluded to earlier, programs evolve and change over time, even if delivered in the same place, in part because the context may change over time, but also the program itself may learn and adapt from what it is doing and continue to improve over time. We also know that programs can change over time when they try and reach a broader population or scale. 
And so one of the things that we highlight in the chapter that's important is that commonly um, implementation research has used kind of um, measurement choices that often entail checklists or point in time observations or interviews of measures, really something that almost characterizes implementation as a steady state phenomenon. But really that's not how the real world works and that's not how programming works. And so one of the things that we're, we highlight in this chapter is the importance of thinking in a multi-dimensional way around kind of these uh, factors that may be um, influencing implementation. So here, um, but are less frequently used. So here, thinking about mixed methods approaches to kind of characterize uh, implementation over time, um, going beyond this kind of static one point in time comparisons, and really trying to think about measurement approaches that allow us to understand how these different influences might interact with each other and uh, work in synergistic ways or in countervailing ways to influence implementation and ultimately the effectiveness of programming. Um, yes, okay, next slide. Okay, so just to, to sum it up, I, uh, we, you know, we don't uh, prescribe particular measurement approaches or prescribe particular uh, methodological approaches, but we really aim to give just uh, a fuller picture of an implementation framework and to help uh, researchers, but also program operators and practitioners to think about what are buckets of influences that may be important to be attuned to when thinking about if the program being delivered is delivered as intended and is it reaching the folks that are intended to be reached um, and how ultimately that influences effectiveness. So um, we, we want to highlight that. I think one of the questions that we often get is, you know, given the breadth of areas that we're looking into, um, how can we systematically collect this information? And I think one of the ways in which the field is moving, which is really important, is around research practitioner partnerships or thinking about how to embed measurement of these different dimensions over time to, to existing structures or systems that programs um, or uh, have. And so I think that is something that is really important. Um, and I think we also need to think about how to widely disseminate this information on a more consistent basis, regardless of whether or not it is clean and tidy story, or as Sarah had mentioned earlier, is really important to kind of lean into the messiness of it so that uh, the field at large can continue to learn um, systematically about what works for whom and under what conditions. So that is it. So I'm gonna turn it over to Milagros. Is that right, Sarah? Yes, thank you, Joanne. Next, we okay. have Milagros who will talk about equity and implementation research. Hi, good afternoon and thank you um, for uh, having me here. Uh, it is a pleasure. So this chapter really is chapter 12 and it really builds on everything you've heard so far in the rest of the, the publication. The chapter more explicitly tries to enhance uh, or attempts to enhance our thinking and really our awareness with an equity perspective in how and when we do our research. And this really means that it tries to fully account how programs operate, how and the degree to which equity is advanced, and to also make us aware of possible biases that we could possibly bring into the research as well. Um, actually, slide, please. That's really what this is. Uh, slide is about. So next slide. The next slide, please. Perfect. So we really um, have to start with um, defining equity and we define it based on the absence of, of systematic and potentially remediable differences in one or more aspects between groups. And then the groups, it is a really varied possibility of groups and it, it includes and inequities may be rooted in gender discrimination, discrimination due to disability status, racial, ethnic, linguistic, minority, minority or religious discrimination, structural poverty, geographic isolation, 
isolation, weak governance, and uh, cultural norms. And the main idea is particularly central given how EC programs are advanced and with the vision that we equity for which we used to advance them, it is because we put them forward with a social justice uh, in, as no social justice initiative. So this idea that they increase equity, reduce disparities, reduce uh, readiness gap or opportunity gaps and inequities. This is vision of increasing equity is central to early childhood field as a whole. And in particular, when we go and research it, we want to understand when it's deviating from it. Um, so that's one of the aspects that is embedded. Because not all programs are equally well, no all programs have operated equally well, and there have definitely been issues of inequities um, or across many of these programs that we have. So, and it's clearly def difficult to do it. I mean, that's why getting it right is hard, and um, and that's what this volume is trying to help us think through. Um, next slide. So, the whole idea is to that that we are aware and think about equity in capturing how the programs and policies and interventions reduce or increase them, in defining it in relation to the context and the disadvantage or the opportunities that are present, and in integrating it in all the components of our research. And this really means from the moment we're thinking our theoretical framework, then we're uh, planning our analysis and sa our sampling and our, our field, and then all the way to where we're interpreting it in the next stage, in the final stage of our research, and where we're even disseminating that research. Next slide. So one of the things that we t that uh, this chapter has to do is engage with definitions, because so that it really creates some sense of what the possibilities are, what we're thinking. And in doing so, we think of, equity as analyzing internal and external processes, assumptions, the individuals, engagement between individuals and what that means, individuals being the pro in the programs and being ourselves as researchers. Um, it is also a perspective that we're having um, in an attempt to understand complex and multidimensional cultural and power-based dynamics. Also, so all through this and really has fielded into um, thinking about how and why things work is uh, critical race theory. So we have to think about that as, a, as we are in the field, but in addition, in terms of what we're measuring and capturing in the field. And aligned with this and how we approach it are as, uh, the definitions of cultural competence and cultural responsiveness. The first one is really about being aware, sensitive, and knowledgeable in how and to, in the way we engage with um, the research. And the second one is much more explicitly engaging when trying to measure aspects of cultural power in our research and the dynamics and the difference and the bias, the system can recreate itself um, due to those. And then the last one is intersectional approaches, which I think the research has been much more in tune with in the latest years. And this is really not thinking of groups as one unique or isolated uh, position, but really thinking about the varied interrelationships. What does it mean for a white girl or a black girl in terms of the dynamics of black boy or a white boy in early in early childhood programs and do dynamics make differences across these two groups in ways or others which the field has already shown us that some of these already exist um, and these are just a couple of the ways that you can look at it so next slide um, so one of the aspects that it's matter is that we really use the equity, cultural competence, and responsiveness, and the intersectional approaches, all of these, in ways that interconnect in our theoretical framework, design, instruments, fieldwork, methods, and analysis, and interpretation, and dissemination. And this chapter is really about creating awareness across all of this, and it is a lot um, across all of this, but, it, but the, to the degree that we can really, really dig deeper into how we do our research. Um, I think we can effectively advance equity. Um, at the core of this is really understanding the complexity of social and power dynamics and really explicitly attempt to recognize, measure, assess differences, reduce biases to the extent that is possible, and be culturally appropriate in the way that we approach the field or in the individuals in which we are and our partners in the, in the programs and interventions that we work with. It is true that uh, maybe some of this aspect may be untenable, but that does not mean that we should not try to achieve this uh, goal in terms of our uh, limitations. So, the co including equity and cultural competences, 
in a research and all this uh, and intersectional approaches in a research really is about allowing more effective interactions between research and participants, adequate perspectives across research components. Do we really represent the different perspectives that are in the field? Improve participation of different groups. And how do we do that if, depending on the sample, depending on the group, of how small a group is, um, adequately represent every group and adequately understand and interpret differential impacts and differential perspectives across the groups. So the next slide. So each of those components, we work through the chapter. I, it's, it's developed in more depth. I am only going to touch on the first two, the theoretical framework and the questions and the sampling. And really, the research and evaluation, we come from all different perspectives. We were trained very differently and we approach early childhood in very different ways. And we do get ingrained in, in, in the, all this knowledge that we have, which is wonderful. At the same time, that evolution theories, the social science theories, the program theories, and the theories of change signify that we are doing implicit and explicit assumptions in how programs and practice operate. And, and to the degree that we can create awareness and think about what we're missing and think about competing theories, uh, if anything, we will enhance our research. So it's really an explicit examination of the values, the beliefs, the approaches of the potential differences that we may have as individuals or are research or theory has in relation to the evaluated population, the degree to, we, to which how we're framing the theory really fits the context and our partners that are allowing us to work with them in terms of the evaluation, uh, being attentive to complex power explanations, so not really not being simplistic about how this could operate and effectively influence what are the ultimate results of, of an intervention or our program and attempting to capture differences in various facilitators across different perspectives and types of individuals. Um, and underlying is the idea that are we really trying to capture and does our model and our theoretical framework and the questions that we put forward try to capture the needs and strengths, the processes, the barriers, the resources, the progress towards outcomes, the effectiveness, who is benefiting in essence more than others, who what are the relevant groups and are we are addressing and looking at all of them and and really trying to understand why it's much more like every um like john just mentioned it is the why here that is the meat of our research but but embedding equity through that understanding of why and the next slide And then a similar exercise we do with uh, design and sampling in which we're really trying to understand are we representing every group, who is and who is not. And by default, a lot of the work that we do does have somebody that is part of a program that, uh, and individuals that are not and the reasons why may exclude it or they could be part of our research and they are not and why matters for that. Um, so who is included with this design, who is excluded, are there ways that we can tweak our design to try to include different perspectives and different types of individuals? Uh, what are the barriers to participation and even to consenting or to time? What are there, this about time, a sampling, about the way we recruit, about the language in, in which we try to access families um, or individuals in the programs? And can we do anything in our research to reduce any of these barriers. Are there research, uh, have we included research about equity? Are we trying to look at different across groups or increasing over time and how this works? And can I distinguish these differences with the design and the sample and the questions that I have? So thinking about that. And what type of selection bias is there in addition, in, in, in the field selection bias is really every time somebody opts for something, they're not opting for an alternative or somebody is, that's not even thinking about opting into something is not thinking of an alternative. So that creates that there are different individuals getting an intervention or being uh, exposed to one and we have to be aware of what that means for our um, interpretation, for our research, for the questions that we're doing and that we, we, can, we can capture that. Um, next. So I really, um, Ultimately, through the whole chapter, it's addressing how an equity lens makes the research process more resp responsive to the ultimate equity goals that we have in early childhood. The, this critical so, so, social justice goals and even social equity goals. Um, so 
we is taking account into existing disadvantages and the processes that are occurring to make sure that we are facilitating, engaging, and being aware and knowledgeable in engaging agents and individuals in the long-term equity change we want to understand and understanding what's working, what is not, and why really needs to have this equity perspective so that we can more strongly support the development of policies to address all of our children's needs wherever they are and, they went to, and where they come. So it's really uh, ultimately what, what I think it is questioning what am I not seeing with what I thought or how we would approach it and what don't I know about individuals, programs and processes that I'm, and then asking also and engaging the researchers, the field, the practitioners, the programs to try to uh, uh, cover those holes that I'm, I am individually not aware, but also that the field might have missed um, as we work on more and more programs. Thank you. Thank you, Milagros. Next, we will have Sharon, who will talk about the contributions of qualitative research in implementation context and understanding implementation. Thanks, Sharon. Hi, everyone. I'm just trying to get myself back on. All of a sudden, my video doesn't want to work. I do apologize. There we are. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm going to talk about why qualitative research can help address all of these issues, because qualitative research really assumes a lot of things about implementation that can't be measured, but need to be attended to in the local and the contextual and the specific. Implementation is not embodied in a program. It's not embodied in a policy. It's actually the outcome of how groups of people interpret, translate and practice aspects of policies and programs in particular educational settings. Next slide, please. So therefore, we can't just assume that we can create a program that can be implemented with fidelity. And we can't assume that because of evidence-based practices that every program will work because we know as much as we know and put it into that kind of programmatic viewpoint. Instead, we have to think about also how the local really shapes what takes place. And the local has many different aspects to it. And this is where qualitative research is really wonderful and rich because qualitative research assumes an interpretive stance to the world. It assumes that knowledge is not objective, that, um, that the way people come to understand and make sense of implementation issues is by being in the moment and by interacting with others, and that we actually construct our social worlds and those worlds are often mediated by culture and context. So qualitative research don't take, as some of my colleagues have already suggested, just one-off samples or measures of particular aspects of implementation. Qualitative researchers particularly, well, it's a bit hard right now in a pandemic era, but we really try and spend extended periods of time in early childhood sites. Some qualitative researchers may spend up to two or three years following a group of children from one early childhood setting to another. We try and examine stakeholders' interpretations through a lot of open-ended interviews, not just a one-off or two or a pre and post, but really talking to people over time in the moment about things that happen in the day-to-day -day context. Often we shadow key stakeholders, observing how they implement a curriculum policy program or practice, capturing those um, I would call off-camera moments, right, when people say things or things happen in the moment that pe can't always be captured by using uh, other approaches. So qualitative researchers try and capture the richness of implementation across time in local sites of practice. Okay, next slide, please. So qualitative research, and I'm just going to give you a taste here, it's not new to early childhood education. In fact, it's been sort of like a line of inquiry for quite some time, for a good 20 to 30 years. And implementation research from a qualitative perspective actually goes back to some of the earliest ethnographies of early childhood education conducted by wonderful researchers like Sally Lubeck and Joe Tobin, if you're aware of preschool and three cultures. However, what has really sparked a renewed interest in implementation research writ large, like what does a policy look like in practice, has been the uh, evolution of public pre-K across many states and the fact that these programs are often delivered through mixed service delivery uh, approaches whereby various kinds of early childhood stakeholders come together to provide pre-K, whether they be Head Start, 
um, private childcare providers, community childcare providers, public for profit, and public schools. And a lot of the uh, or the qualitative research that's on this uh, topic tends to look at the cultural, conceptual, and pedagogical tensions that occur between public pre-K programs as they move into being systematized within the early elementary grades. Now, those of us who've worked with children under five know we don't seem to have the same value, goodness knows why, but we don't in terms of how we deliver and approach the education of young children. We have tended to focus on the education of young children as something that's more developmentally appropriate, and therefore our em emphasis on subject matter has been typically from an integrated curriculum perspective, and we've really tried to focus on um, working with children to build their, under their embedded understandings of concepts uh, into more disembedded concepts through our interactions with them in small groups, large groups, and a lot through choice and play. That kind of philosophy often clashes with the, uh, originally not K, but K has really changed over the last decade or so, but also the early elementary grades. So that there's a lot of uh, studies available that talk about what happens when pre-K teachers, for example, are asked to come up with a, a, a developmentally appropriate readiness assessment for the children to move into kindergarten and the pushback they get from uh, the elementary uh, teachers about how that's not how we do it in elementary school. And even, um, not only is there these conceptual clashes, but these are also very deeply embedded cultural understandings of what it means to teach young children. And as a consequence, we have these pedagogies. In my own research, for example, I've gone into sites where kindergarten teachers have said, these pre-K children know nothing. They can't sit still, they can't write their name, they can't do this. And that's because they're using the high scope curriculum in pre-K. Now, whether that's accurate or not is not the point. The point is that there's these assumptions being made because of these two very differing perspectives on what it means to teach young children. And some of the qualitative research on implementation of public pre-K has also tried to delve deeper and trying to understand the factors that tend to mediate implementation. All implementation researchers do this. You know, why does it work in one side and not another? What conditions made it happen here and not in that place? Um, and obviously these are some of the most common ones, but one of, some of the ones that have come up are obviously leadership and the fact that early childhood leaders, who is in responsible for bringing or creating early childhood systems within a local site or a local community and how they interpret and what kinds of um, political decisions they make about the implementation and how they value teachers in different sites can lead to different kinds of outcomes for children. Uh, we look at, talk a lot about resources and people think resources is just money, but it's not. It's about time. It's about materials. We have evidence that shows that in some pre-K programs that may be operating in a Head Start site, despite getting state funding, because the Head Start site is lacking resources for other reasons, that, that pr those pre-K teachers in that site may not get the same opportunities for their children to have free play or for their children to, or for, their, for them to be able to get substitute teachers when needed for prep time. So what this means is it's not, it's not a blame game, but to suggest that different kinds of politics or power relationships come into play in local sites of practice. And there are unintended consequences of different kinds of early childhood policies as they play out in practice. And what qualitative researchers try and do is not just label these as these are the factors, factor one, factor two, factor three, although I like doing research like that too, but much more about what are the interrelations between these things. So for example, if you take the Head Start example, there was a politics of knowledge going on in that site because of different funding streams, a leader who wasn't sure about or how to use resources effectively to ensure there were enough substitute teachers, working in an urban community where there weren't access to a lot of substitute teachers, which is a resources issue, and then the combination of different policies operating at exactly the same side of practice. I mean, that's another thing I think we often take for granted that qualitative researchers um, illuminate, is how um, every early childhood site is the site of multiple policies and practices at the same time. So the early childhood teachers are often being pulled betwixt and between uh, across different policies. And that's what qualitative researchers illustrate. Um, so next slide, please, Cherise. 
So uh, in this chapter, we talk. Uh, I talk about uh, moving towards a qualitative research agenda in implementation research. And in this, uh, I talk about different ways that we might approach this. One is, first of all, to think about investigating multiple levels of the early, of early childhood systems. I think my colleagues have illuminated this very well, but I do want to talk about two aspects to this. One is like looking vertically, like how is something implemented from a, pol from a policy all the way down to a child in a, a local home uh, and all the way up, starting from the child and moving all the way out, which some studies have done. Another is to look horizontally, right, at how something happens, how does a policy, a practice and innovation get taken up across multiple sites at the same time, right? But doing those two together, and I think often we miss certain levels, which takes me to the next idea, which is a focus on all stakeholders. So when someone comes up with a pre-K policy in mind, or we look at some kind of early childhood intervention, we tend to often look at children, much less at early childhood teachers. Often we overlook leaders, like state systems leaders, for example, who have a real challenging job. Um, coaches, teacher leaders, there's so many layers, families, so communities. There are communities who can really shape what early childhood programming looks like based on particular assumptions about what counts for education. And so therefore, it's really important that as we focus more towards some qualitative work, that we think about how to incorporate all those stakeholders. How do we capture those different perspectives? And how do we do that, as uh, my colleagues have suggested, at different developmental points of, an implement, of implementation of an innovation? Because how we conceptualize and enact coaching, for example, in a pre-K program or an early elementary program in say, day three of something is very different five years later. And how did that coaching model evolve? And for what reasons? And how does it still operate? What are some of the remnants of that model that last? And what are things that haven't been sustained and why? So we really have to make sure that we focus on the workforce rich large because there are, and this takes me to my next point, a lot of inequities taking place at the local level. And qualitative research has illustrated this over and over again, particularly in terms of compensation of early childhood educators. For example, in a study um, by my colleague Beth Grau uh, in Wisconsin and also in New Jersey, we found that teachers uh, in Wisconsin creating pre-K programs is under local control. That means a district gets a bundle of money and how they exercise and spend that money at, in terms of creating a pre-k program is really up to local local leaders so in some sites or some districts there was no pay parity between early childhood teachers working in head start and childcare sites and those working in public schools now that may not sound unusual we know this but the fact that there was public funds available to establish parity then illustrates well why why does this happen and what assumptions are being made right about who early childhood educators are and what and what they do and where it should occur right and what should be valued as curriculum and pedagogy and outcomes and as a consequence it leads to again unintended consequences like teachers leaving the field um, and when and good quality teachers not um, being available so it's really important for us to think about inequity. Inequity is also, as Malagros was saying, about kids' experiences, families' experiences, but it can't just be at a systems level or across programs. We have to look deeply, and this is where qualitative research is particularly powerful. It allows you to look at five or six children's experiences over time and how certain children get access to what looks like the same amount of resources and the same opportunities as other kids, but how that will vary and is mediated by how teachers interpret children's behavior, children's bodies, children's understandings, children's color, children's language, et cetera. So the idea that equity, it, it really affects the workforce, it affects children, it affects families, but how do we really incorporate that and qualitative research can be particularly effective in this matter. Now, having said that, challenges with qualitative research, as much as I love it, is that it tends to go so deep and so close that it doesn't allow for us to capture 
uh, pop to like do large scale policy capturing work around you know what works what doesn't what was implemented with fidelity etc so this is where as my colleagues have already suggested mixed methods designs are important but i would suggest that with qualitative studies we can use the um, contributions of qualitative research and the strengths of a qualitative approach to actually begin to do some exploratory studies first around key issues that we think take place in the field but we may not be sure about to begin to identify key things that we should then perhaps start to extrapolate and measure as part of our implementation research. At the same time, qualitative research done across a number of sites that's part of a larger scale study, say across multiple states, can also be really valuable in taking what we know from the larger quantitative data and then contextualizing it even further by understanding why implementation occurred in particular sites in a particular way and not in others. And in this way, we really get down deep into local variation uh, as long as we carefully select those sites in which we do the qualitative work. So for me, qualitative research. Sharon. Yep. Sharon, thank you so much. But in the interest well, of time, we are going to move on so that Caroline can talk about how we can proceed with smarter implementation research. Caroline? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a, my pleasure to be here. And section three of the book covers how we get smarter. And as I read through the five chapters and reviewed the presentations in preparation to share some comments, the first thing that came to my mind is we can get smarter and think about how we move forward by first considering how we begin and beginning with the end in mind. And so I'm going to frame my comments around thinking about the five chapters and the four presentations you've just heard in terms of implementation research as a roadmap that will help us to get to a destination that has significant consequences for the children and families and communities that early care and education programs are designed to serve. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. And so the way we get there is I think we need to begin I'm sorry, go back to the previous slide, please, to begin by defining our destination. And I've included here three quotes from uh, chapters in the Getting It Right book that I think accurately summarize what we really care about. What is our motivation for this work and why and how do we think uh, implementation research can inform what we do in early care research and practice? And first and foremost, we want to improve outcomes and the lives of children and families and communities, especially by narrowing opportunity and achievement gaps that affect minoritized children and children of poverty the most. And so we want to do that that's our destination, that's where we're headed. And we wanna make sure that the research that we do helps us to understand and address the roots of those opportunity and achievement gaps. And implementation research is one way we can do that to inform what we do in terms of the programming so that we can provide better programs and services to children across a wide range of early care and education settings. Next slide, please. So how do we get there? How do we get to our destination when what we really care about is doing a better job of serving families and communities and doing research um, that is more mindful and thoughtful? So number one, in trying to capture everything that was covered in this book and in this section of the book, chapter 12 covers doing focusing on equity. And Morongos did a great job of defining equity. I'm not going to get into that, but I really wanted to start with what is the last chapter in the section as the first thing for us to consider in terms of implementation research. And that's to conduct equity-focused implementation research. And what do I mean by that? I mean that we need to adopt an equity perspective and approach at every stage and every phase of the implementation research process. In this chapter of the book, Milagros really outlines what that means in terms of our theory, our measures, and our methods. And we also need to think about and acknowledge that every stakeholder, including the researchers, the policymakers, the practitioners, the families, the communities, I would even say the educators, we need to understand the attitudes and beliefs and assumptions of everyone who's a part of the process. And we need to prioritize the people who are the focus of early care and education programs. If we think about the racial and cultural and linguistic diversity 
of the children and families and communities that we want to serve, that should really guide us in terms of doing equity focused research to provide us with better information so we can provide better services and programs. And then we also need to understand the context and systems that impact the lives of the families and the children and the communities we want to serve so that we can identify where there are barriers and bridges and opportunities to improve research and practice. Next slide, please. My next two slides really cover the, the other chapters in this section. And the first, uh, this is a, a, a uh, Sharon's already covered this really well, but we need number two in terms of thinking about how we get to where we want to be. We need to think about rigorous methods and measures. And both qualitative and quantitative measures are important and methods and approaches. And so this is a two part uh, slide here. This slide really outlines some of the benefits of the qualitative research approach which Sharon has just done a beautiful job of discussing. I'm not going to go over every point here on, on the slide, but I do want to highlight that, again, if we're thinking about who we're serving and how we go about doing that, that one of the great benefits of implementation research methods and approaches is that it will help us to understand policies and programs and practices that work and don't work. It'll give us insight about the different stakeholders who are involved in the process and about the systems and the context and the people and how that may hinder or support implementation and sustainability of interventions and programming. And in this chapter, Sharon really highlighted two areas where I think more research is needed and both qualitative and quantitative measures are important. And one is around trying to identify opportunities where pre-K and K-12 educators can engage with each other because I think they have a shared interest in the care and education of children and students across their, their developmental trajectory and their education and learning trajectory. And then to also think about how we can do a better job of understanding the role of early care and education leaders in terms of their role as barriers or bridges to changes that we want to implement and that we try to study in implementation research and program evaluation and how they can support or hinder program improvement and lasting change. Next slide, please. In their presentations, Joanne and Tamara did a great job of outlining the frameworks and the theories and the approaches and the methods that implementation research can bring to bear on early care and education, especially as we think about evaluation of early childhood programs, scaling up early childhood programs. And two key points from this slide that I'd like to highlight are, one, we really need to think about using rigorous and relevant measures to understand what works for whom and under what conditions. And often we find out what doesn't work when we do this in a thoughtful way, but, but the implementation research can really give us some good insights that will then inform whether we need to improve a program or try something different. I think it's also important to think about how we can incorporate the best principles and practices from implementation science in both the development and evaluation of early care and education programs. A lot of the discussion often centers around the role of implementation research when we're trying to evaluate or understand a program that we've already rolled out or a policy that's already in place. I think it's equally important to bring these principles and ideas and methods to bear on the development of programs and policies and practices before we roll them out, before we get to where we're evaluating them, so that we're asking questions around, is this really feasible for this community? Is it useful to them? Is it going to be beneficial to them? And so really thinking about how we bring to bear a lot of the information that's covered in what Tamara and Joanne shared, as well as Sharon and Milagros, how we bring that to bear is when we're developing programs, as well as when we're evaluating programs and how all of the principles from implementation research and practice can serve as well in doing that. Uh, Tamara talked about what I, as I read this chapter, I thought, well, it's really sort of these blurred lines between implementation science and improvement science. And it's important to think about both as we try to improve what we do in terms of evaluation studies of early education programs. And then what's critically important um, as we think again about what's our destination, who we're trying to serve, and the fact that we're serving a diverse community of young children and families in the early care and education space, that we really need to bring the best that we have in terms of qualitative and quantitative methods and measures and approaches to bear on looking at sources of variation that can foster or support 
and or hinder program effectiveness and sustainability. So again, really thinking about having an equity focus and using rigorous and relevant methods and measures. Next slide, please. And then we also need to think about where we need to make adjustments. So I have three points here to cover. One is that we really need to pay attention to our current context. We're in the middle of a global pandemic. And if we're trying to serve uh, children and families from vulnerable communities, then we have to think about the fact that right now, as we are having this conversation, that those disparities, those gaps, those opportunity and achievement gaps are widening in the midst of the pandemic. We're also in a space where we're having a lot of conversations about racial injustice and systemic racism. So how can all of those factors from what we're seeing in our current social and political context inform what we do as we think about implementation research and early childhood programs? How can we change our existing theories and methods to uh, prioritize equity, equity as we do our work? And what can we do to make sure that we have a diversity of voices at the table as we think about the decisions we make in terms of what research to do, what policies and programs to roll out. Next slide, please. And then finally, um, with all of those things in mind, thinking about what are some of the priorities that we need to consider and how implementation research methods and approaches can help us as we move forward. I think we can really strengthen the relevance of our work because we emphasize rigor a lot, but relevance is equally important. We can strengthen the relevance of our rigorous research by again, focusing on equity across the entire approach from beginning to end to dissemination and messaging of whatever research findings we have. We can think about how to use rigorous scientific standards that promote rigor and relevance and transparency. For example, at IES, we have these new SEER standards that encourage researchers to do things like pre-register their studies and disseminate and share data sets and findings to make sure that others can replicate what they're doing. And we need to think about how we develop better programs and systems to implement and scale. We talk a lot about how implementation research can, again, inform what we're evaluating, but I think we also think to need about need to think about what we learn from that and then how it can help us to do better. And that means are there places where we need to go back to the drawing board and develop better programs and systems? And then we need to work on measurement. I think several people touched on this. It's an ongoing priority that we need to do a better job of developing the right tools so that we can do better work to get a better understanding of what we need to do to serve the families and the communities. And then we really need to invest in more research initiatives that cover a broader range of issues and concerns for the early childhood workforce. In her chapter, Sharon talked a lot about compensation and, and, and inequities in that in terms of how early care and edu early care educators are treated. And then we also need to think about better measures and approaches for understanding their attitudes, their beliefs, their practices, but a more systematic approach to how we think about understanding the workforce because we are demanding a lot of them and they're a key uh, component, a key player as we think about how we can indeed narrow opportunity and achievement gaps for children and families and communities in early care and education. So I went through that very quickly in the interest of time and so we have time for discussion. So happy to turn it over to, um, to folks who are managing the Q&A time. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. I hope you join me in thanking the wonderful presentations we've heard so far. And I wanted to thank you for sending in questions throughout the webinar. Please continue to use the questions feature to submit any questions you may have at this time. I'm going to open by open this live Q&A session by asking our presenters to respond to some of the questions that have already been asked. But please continue to add some to the question box and we'll see if we have time to get some more. Um, the first question that I would like to ask you, um, Tamara. Um, the question, Tamara, can you address the external evaluation? Can you science approach? I can't hear you, Christine. Are you, okay. Could you repeat the question? Let's see. Is that, sure. Is this any better? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Can you address the need for external evaluation? Can improvement science approach be valid even with internal evaluation? 
Tamara, are you able to hear my question? Yes, yes. yes. I, so the question is, can you use, um, can, do you need an external evaluator to have an, a valid evaluation um, in terms of implementation or improvement or both? I, I guess that's my question back. My interpretation of the question is, is the improvement science approach valid if you're just doing internal evaluation? It would seem that implementation science requires external valid evaluation for validity. So is there a need for external evaluation? So, okay, so uh, my response to that is that um, some of the innovative research methods and evaluation methods that I mentioned do not require um, like a firewall, let's say, between the evaluation and the implementers. So one example is developmental evaluation that I mentioned um, during my presentation. Developmental evaluation it also goes by different names. Sometimes it's called um, emergent evaluation or uh, adaptive evaluation or um, anyway, it has, has a bunch of different names, but the basic um, method is that the evaluator, so to speak, is kind of embedded within the group of implementers that are implementing the whatever it is, the program, the policy, and that evaluator helps facilitate those who are um, implementing to use information, use data, and analyze it in real time to inform to understand how things are going, how, how implementation is going, how to adjust and adapt so that they can improve upon the implementation of what they're doing and also um, improve the results that they're getting. So um, you don't necessarily need to have um, somebody external or um, be in, like tell others what's going on, that you can also have the, those members of your team be facilitating that. And it's especially um, relevant for improvement science uh, methodologies where you're really teaching the principles of implementation science to the implementers so that they can use those tools themselves to learn how to improve. So the use of data and um, and feedback loops to that, that data, use of data, is very much a part of what improvement science methodologies do. And they are definitely for the benefit of the implementers and to improve, improve implementation rather than to um, be holding the implementers to some kind of external standard, but to focus on improving what they're doing. Thank you. Tamara, thank you for, and hopefully it has responded to our question for that um, question asked, that was question asked. Um, my next question is for Joanne. Joanne, this question came in during your presentation. The question was, did researchers find that external factors had a significant impact on delivery? Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, so thanks for asking that question. I think one of the things, so I'm going to underscore two points. One is, um, so one of the studies that I love the best is one that's is secondary analysis actually conducted by Howard Bloom and Chris Weiland of the Head Start Impact Study data. And I think one of the things that that underscores is that the overall impact of Head Start in the, in the main, in the pooled impact analysis shows small positive impacts for kids. But then when you disaggregate those findings and try and look at whether or not each site that was participating in the study had an impact, you actually see that there was wild variation in the magnitude of the impacts um, across the different sites. And I think that really underscores for me the likelihood that there are external factors that really contribute to whether or not a program is effective or not. So that point of comparison, what is the comparison, I think is really um, underscored there. Where they find the largest impacts is when there is no real counterpart to early 
center-based early care and education that's really provided. Um, so I think that underscores, I think context does matter. Um, outside influences do matter. But then I think related to that, whether or not what those drivers are in those contexts that really drive implementation, I think is something that we have to study much more systematically. I think it is much more common for research to focus on those things. So Carolyn made this point. When something is ready at scale and there is not a real understanding of what are those conditions either at the organizational level or in the context around it that really supported the strong implementation and delivery of a program when it was on a small scale or when it was being developed. So then when it goes to a larger scale, I think nobody really has a systematic understanding of which are the features that really drove that then, that it was, we know that things are implemented more or less better in certain situations, circumstances or different sites do more or less better, but it's conflated with all these other factors that I think are really hard to disentangle. And so I think really it's probably not going to be a satisfying answer, but I think more research, we just need to know more and we need to look into it more and we need to look outside the programs more in a systematic way to really understand what are the key drivers that matter most or what are clusters of drivers and profiles of drivers um, that matter more or less to how a program is implemented and whether or not it's implemented as the intended model but also recognize that that's only one piece of the story. Um, the contextual factors around that also drive it as well. So I don't know if others have anything to add. You know, it doesn't have to just be me answering it. <laughs> I think I just add that I think the focus on in, in doing a mixed method for your evaluation that includes the a qualitative component that Sharon mentioned and others have mentioned is really important and will help you identify those contextual factors and tease apart, um, you know, what exactly was important for the effects that you got. Thank you both. Um, I have a question from the audience that was posed to all of the speakers. So anyone can feel free to chime in. It says, can one of the speakers explain how we can use quantitative methods and measures to understand the sources of variation that foster or hinder program effectiveness and sustainability? So how can we use quantitative methods and measures to understand the sources of variation that foster or hinder program effectiveness and sustainability? Maybe I'll give it a try. <laughs> um, I, when we, all the time that we, we've been talking about mixed methods, that be, that's because we're trying to look at breadth. Um, I think quantitative really looks more at um, breadth, while ex, uh, um, qualitative really it's about depth in a lot of the cases and exploring much more in depth, particularly in a sample that it's small. But in quantitative analysis, we really can address not everything that we would in a mixed method style, but some aspects by being very attentive and very careful about including meth methods or surveys or aspects that we can then bring together that do uh, capture um, a variation of possible barriers. One way to do that effectively is to sort of embed a mixed method at the beginning in which we're having conversations with a small group to then create what are the, the type of things that we need to include in the survey, review that, and then include that at a larger scale in a much more wide uh, scenario. So for example, we could have a subgroup or a pilot or a focus group in which we analyze these are the barriers that we were thinking, what are we missing, what things have you considered, what other types of PD are we not capturing, What other, and then go at a large scale with a survey that includes all of those at a moment, and then I also do believe that you can still maintain some open-ended aspects in those and then bring them together. It does take much more time consuming than if you are very specific about uh, getting much more depth in a smaller sample. But um, but you won't get the depth that you would in the, in the qual analysis and the mixed method. So you, I think so long as you understand what the limitations are 
and that you are very purposeful and intentional about looking at variation from different perspectives and not the, just the ones that we traditionally look at and that to define that variation you use your informants um, and not just the perspective that one brings in that could actually more effectively cap make the quantitative methods capture more across groups within groups than um, what we traditionally do. Hope that helps. Thank you, Miranis. Did anyone else want to chime in? I have another question that is for the entire um, group for anyone to, to jump in on. Um, so this, um, this starts with a comment. It appears that the philosophical orientation of the researcher seems to drive the design of the research and the interpretation of the results. Can someone comment on how this affects the impact of the research and whether it truly reflects effectiveness or only the philosophical stance of the researcher? I'll give it a go. So basically, um, all researchers very carefully engage in ver methods of validity to ensure that it's not just their biases and their orientation shaping how they interpret the data and what they count as evidence for findings. So um, that's good research, good rigorous research, regardless of which orientation you work from. But every researcher should also be open about their positionality and say, because I operate implementation research from this perspective, I will see this is how, what, what the products might look like, and this is what we can answer in terms of questions for you, and this is what we can't answer, right? Um, and I think as Malagros was saying, and Joanne and Tamara, it's really important about also working with the community and the key stakeholders involved and asking them and working with them around uh, what they also like to learn, whether that's a policy maker or a local school district, um, to ensure that whatever you design is going to help uh, provide uh, evidence and insight into a particular problem of practice, whatever that may be. So it's, uh, sometimes researchers aren't open about their orientations, but if they're rigorous, they will be, which is, you know, they're very open about the strengths and limitations of their approaches and what their assumptions are about what counts as knowledge and what counts as evidence. But if there's no evidence ever collected that supports a, an assertion being made by a researcher, then you should be concerned. But um, good researchers would never do that. Thank you, Sharon. Does anyone else want to um, offer an opinion here? So okay. this is. Okay. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, please go ahead. Is there another question, Christine? Um. Nope. You can go ahead. Okay. So I just wanted to kind of add to that that I think, um, in terms of the the perspective of the researcher and maintaining objectivity. I think um, Sharon touched on this, but that's where it's important, I think, when researchers are engaging in work that they are in fact working closely with communities and that it's not just, even if they're coming to the experience with sound theories and ideas, it's critically important to engage. In. And that's why I think researcher practitioner partnerships are one powerful way to do that. But there are other ways, even if you don't have a formal way of engaging in that way, that you are being thoughtful and mindful about figuring out what really matters for the community. Um, after years of working with a lot of researchers who proposed and conducted studies, it's, it's pretty clear to me that people do come with ideas and um, sometimes their ideas are confirmed and sometimes they're not. And it's helpful to have some outside voices speaking um, to kind of push people on some of their thoughts and ideas and maintain objectivity. I also think one of the things I touched on in my comments was why I think this is so important as we move forward, um, improving the scientific rigor is asking researchers to do things like pre-register their, their questions that they're proposing to answer because that's a good sort of 
uh, check on what they're doing. And I think, as, as Sharon alluded to, a really thoughtful researcher or research team, because it's usually not one person doing this, um, would, would make sure that they have a team of folks working with them who are bringing different ideas and perspectives to the work, and maybe even engage with advisors as well as, as the community that they're trying to, to understand and, and where they're trying to do the research to make sure that there are a diversity of, of perspectives um, informing what they do at their hypothesis generation stage, but also as they interpret the work, and also when they get ready to disseminate it, because I think um, potent, there's a potential for bias at each stage of the work. Christine, if I can only add, I think in my experience, inter interdisciplinary work also helps a lot in that we all bring extremely different perspectives depending on the combination of disciplines and, and a, a quite different types of training. And in that sense, when we come together and we check it from all different perspectives, I think we get a much more um, central is, or a much more strong, a st much stronger study than we would if we would just uh, talk to individuals just like us. Right, absolutely. Well, thank you. Thank you both. Thank you to all of our presenters for sharing their time and expertise with us today. Thank you also to all who attended for just tuning in today. We want to um, invite you to join us again on Wednesday, September 2nd for part three on moving towards equity in early care and education using implementation research, where we're going to continue this discussion. You can visit the foundation's website at fcd-us.org for more detailed information. Thank you all, have a wonderful afternoon.